sure looks like you have a reason and people would rightly call you, aptly call you irrational if you were to sort of <laughs> shrug it off and say, yay, I realize that's like really powerful reason in favor of this proposition, but you know, I don't care or whatever. So I, I think if you take a close look at the epistemic realm, I think there's quite good reasons to believe that they're not all hypothetical. And I think something is similar is true of morality. Welcome everyone to today's AMA, where we're pleased to welcome Professor Terence Cuneo. He is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Vermont and received his PhD from Fordham University. His primary research interest is in meta-ethics, meta but he also does work in early modern philosophy and the philosophy of religion. His, book include the, uh, his books include The Normative Web, An Argument for Moral Realism, Speech and Morality on the Meta-Ethical Implications of Speaking, and Ritualized Faith, Essays on the Philosophy of Liturgy. He also has a variety of published articles. Uh, you can feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome, uh, Professor Cuneo. So, Happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks for right. having me. All right. Wonderful. So we're going to dive in uh, with the questions about moral philosophy. I'm sure. Uh, familiar territory for you. So, Dr. Cuneo, uh, research polls consistently show that majority of philosophers are moral realists, and that goes both for theist philosophers and atheist philosophers. However, there's a very spirited debate about this, and those people that hold to moral anti-realism are very passionate about uh, their <laughs> position. So yeah. can you briefly describe what the debate uh, in recent times has been like, and what uh, has been your take on the whole debate and um, your position? Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh... This may be a, a bit tricky to sort of summarize the main contours of the debate. It's a fascinating debate. Um, it's one that you can trace all the way back to Plato. And I would say something very similar to the debate you find that's going on now in philosophical circles is certainly present in the early modern period. Um, you know, with the, the lull... Uh, in philosophy that was logical positivism where certain kinds of questions got suppressed. Um, you know, after that, after philosophers got over that, um, you know, since, boy, I don't know, 70s maybe, um, there's been a super lively debate with philosophers defending a lot of different positions. And um, I think it's a, a sign of the health of the discipline that we have so many different positions being defended in you know, really creative and powerful ways. So on the one hand, you have sort of, you have the moral realists and you could probably think of the moral realists as coming in three basic varieties, uh, depending on how you're categorizing things. Um, you have the moral naturalists like uh, Richard Boyd, Nick, Nick Sturgeon, uh, David Kopp. They wanna say that there are objective moral facts um, but uh, they're natural facts, where <laughs> what exactly it is for something to be natural gets spelled out in somewhat different ways, but roughly the idea is something like um, uh, you know, they play uh, an explanatory role in, or are suited to play an explanatory role in the natural sciences. Then they have the non-naturalists who also believe that there are moral facts, subjective moral facts, um, and they want to say that these facts are not natural. Uh, they're not the sort of things whose very essence it is to play an explanatory role in the natural sciences, even though they might. That's not like what these things really are at their core. Um, and then you have the supernaturalist who would say objective moral facts, but in some sense they're grounded in the nature or activities of God. So that's like, that's, that's the moral realist camp. The moral anti-realist camp is even more diverse. Um, sort of at the the extreme, you have error theorists who basically are the analog to atheists when it comes to theism. So they think that moral realists have basically described what morality would have to be like were it to exist. It would have to be objective. It would have to be authoritative. They just hold that nothing could be like that. So there are no moral facts. Um, then you have constructivists of various sorts who want to say that in some interesting sense, human activity 
constructs or creates moral reality, perhaps in a similar way to the way we get um, the rules of games up and running or positive law. Uh, we make compacts and agreements of various sorts or codify certain kinds of behaviors and so on and so forth that are beneficial. Um, and then you have the expressivists, which um, in a lot of ways are in a lot of ways, are the most radical, depending how you look at it, they're, they might be the most radical version of anti-realism in the sense that they want to say that uh, moral thought and discourse really isn't even the business of trying to describe moral reality. Um, so they differ from the realists and the anti-realists, such as the error theorists in that regard. Um, but they tend to get very clever, very sophisticated, so there's not really a description of the expressivist position that's going to satisfy everybody. That's kind of the lay of the land. I see. Uh, wonderful. So we will get to our voice question soon, uh, but there is a um, question that was really, I guess, at the back of our minds. Uh, suppose we have a moral anti-realist, okay, someone who's very passionate about it. What are the best tactics we could pursue to try and persuade this person um, to perhaps either adopt or seriously consider moral realism? Like, what would be uh, the best um, strategy? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny, as a uh... As professional philosophers, I think persuasion is not the first thing that comes to, to mind when we, we do our thing. We, we realize that persuading others of our position is a really big ask. So, you know, the best we can do is sort of develop it with as much power and sophistication as we can, and then, you know, see what they make of it. Um, but the thought of actually persuading the anti-realist or the anti-realist persuading the realist is, a, as I say, a big, big ask. That having been said, um, there there are any number of strategies. I think um, um, I would say many of the most promising strategies drill down on the sort of methodology that's at work in anti-realist positions, um, really probing what sort of assumptions they're making about how to construct and develop uh, a meta-ethical view. And the objections that I think are available to realists is that um, the methodology that's at work in anti-realist positions is often quite suspect, uh, big problems, whereas the sort of methodology that's at work uh, when realism is defended, at least in, in ways that... Um, are are compelling is um is is sound it's much it's much more um um yeah i'll just leave it at that it, they they, they want to say that the methodology at work when realism is developed in a compelling way is is apt it's it's good methodology so that's a super abstract description of um how it goes, but um, I'd be happy to fill in some of the details here. But um, um, you know, maybe the sort of thing that uh, a realist might point out that is that in developing their views, anti-realists cherry pick in certain kinds of ways or uh, ignore certain sorts of data that a good theory should try to accommodate and explain. Um, or if they ignore them, they don't really give good reasons for ignoring these data. Um, whereas realism will take a wide range of data from ordinary moral experience and say, offer a view that both accommodates and explains uh, these data. So these are broadly methodological approaches to engaging with moral anti-realism, and they really need to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, then there are strategies such as the one that I develop in the normative web and speech and morality, which try to argue basically 
that the price tag of going anti-realist is just too high. That if you go anti-realist about morality, you're going to have to go anti-realist about other domains, such as the domain of epistemology or practical reason. That's, that's uh, one way to go, or the sort of argument that I develop in speech and morality is something like, uh, if you go anti-realist, you're going to have a difficult time describing how it, explaining how it is that we could speak, perform speech acts of various sorts. So those are two types of strategies. Um, methodological strategy and the uh, and uh, raise the price tag. The price the price is too high. Strategy. I see. Uh, we will get back to that because it's a very interesting point you've just touched on. But before that, Quant King had a question he would like to ask you on voice and perhaps engage with you. Quant, go ahead. Uh, could I ask uh, like a load, like more than one question? Like I, I don't want to uh, take up too much time, but I don't want to. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with one and we'll see. Okay, so I think uh, what I'm first going to uh, address is the... Uh, um, yeah, well, I don't know. I, I want to address something, but I also want to ask about uh, his opinion on uh, Kantian, uh, like Kantian constructivism um, and uh, what he his views on that were and as such. Uh... What are my views about Kantian constructivism? Well, the view comes in a whole bunch of different forms, in a very radical form, such as the like what Christine Korsgaard defends. I think the view is highly implausible. Um, uh, in a whole bunch of moves that strike me as deeply uncompelling um, are at its heart. So here's the basic Kantian idea as I take it. There are human agents, and human agents have really significant worth. Um, and as a result, they have rights of various sorts, and we have obligations to agents. Uh, so the big question is, what grounds this worth? A certain kind of constructivist wants to say it's the mere fact that we each agent values him or herself is what grounds uh, an agent's worth. That strikes me as really, really problematic. That's the Coors Guard move. Um, but there are like less radical versions, such as Scanlon's view, where it's a constructivist view only about um, obligation. So it's, it's limited in its scope. Um, I've got more sympathy with those sorts of positions, although at the end of the day, I don't sign on. I see. Uh, wonderful. So, Durr had a question he would also like to ask on voice and perhaps engage. Durr, go ahead. Uh, thank you for doing this AMA. really appreciate it. Um, oh, my pleasure. So, I actually had a handful of questions, but uh, the first one was just, and sorry, I'm outside, so if it's loud, just let me know and I'll mute. But my first one is what your thoughts were, and I think you've written about this a little bit, but just maybe a, a sentence or two on... Uh, realists were naturalists, so Cornell realism is a is a typical example of this. Do you think that project, um, and not necessarily just the Cornell realists, people like Frank Jackson and these other kinds of uh, naturalists, do you think any of those projects have any uh, real shot at a uh, sort of uh, picking out what we really mean by uh, wrong and right and so on? Um, yeah, I do actually. I think in this respect, I'm different from many of my fellow non-naturalists. So uh, David Enoch, uh, in a conversation years ago, asked me, "Hey, you know, what's your what's your like what's your backup view? If you think if you came to the conclusion that moral non-naturalism is false, like what view would you endorse?" And he he came out and he said, "Well, I'd be an error theorist." <laughs> <laughs> and like for me, error theorist is almost last on the list. I would not be an error theorist. I'd be a moral naturalist if um, if uh, I had to choose uh, uh, where I had to sort of come to the view that moral non-naturalism is incorrect. Um, I think these views get a lot right. I, I think they get a lot right about the nature of moral thought, moral discourse, 
I think they can preserve a lot of the aspects of moral objectivity. I think where they run into problems is accounting for the authority of reasons. You know, where roughly speaking, the authority of moral reasons consists in their being categorical. They apply to you, but not in virtue of contingent desires you have. That's kind of rough. And they're excellent in the sense that um, you know, they tend to outweigh uh, other competing reasons. Um, naturals have a tougher time with this for a variety of reasons. Um, so that's, that's where I get off the boat. But like I say, if I were forced to do it, I would say, yeah, there are moral facts. We thought they were authoritative, but they're not. Um, that, that would probably be the view I would defend. I see. Thank you. Um, and if I could ask a follow-up, this is somewhat unrelated, but it's going to be a little bit hard to explain uh, briefly. But there's this general idea I've seen where the basic idea goes something like this. You have a view of properties that's very sort of um, cheap, so to speak, the sort of David Lewis idea that properties are cheap. Um, and so someone says something like, well, we can grant that there's a property like wrongness, and we just sort of have for this property an extension of the thing, the states of affairs that are wrong, and so on. But someone might come along and say, that's fine, there is a real property called wrongness. There's also infinitely many other degenerate properties like wrongness and so on. And the question is going to be, in virtue of what should we care about the sort of wrongness property versus these all these other degenerate properties, so to speak, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, you probably are like aware of um, uh, the sense developed in Mati Eklund's book. Right. Uh, yeah, along these lines. Uh, I think there are a lot of things to say about this. Um, um, you know, one thing to ask is whether like properties really do come that cheaply. Um, so that's one thing to ask. But th but then again, then again, I want to hear a whole lot more about uh, these degenerate properties. Um, like, are they the sorts of things that uh, their instantiation provide reasons? Um, of any sort. If they're not, then yeah, okay, fine. I, I can see reasons why I can see why we shouldn't care about them all. They just are not reason providing. And if they do provide reasons to act, um, then I want to know what kind. Like, do they provide counter reasons of various sorts? You know, if a, does the the property of wrong star <laughs> give you a reason to do it or something like that? Well, if that's the case, you know, I don't want to pay any attention to that property, right? Because it's just equivalent to uh, doing what one morally ought not to do. Um, um, and then the debate keeps going on. So, but you can see what the strategy is. The strategy is something like you need to tell me more about these degenerate properties. And once you tell me more, I can tell you why I care about them or, or why I don't. I see. Thank you. So you, you, you wouldn't think that. Um, so I've seen some people try to say that, well, moral realism could be true in this extremely minimal way where you have these sorts of properties, but they actually have no sort of normative force. Yeah. They don't give reasons. Yeah. They just sort yeah. of exist out there. You, don't, yeah. you wouldn't grant that yeah. as being like a reasonable view. Well, I mean, it's just a, it's like a super minimal view that I don't really think is very interesting. Um, uh, it's a view that I think, to go back to some of my earlier comments, that I think is methodologically suspect. We, what we want of a meta-ethical view is one that accommodates and explains a, a wide range of the meta-ethical data. And I think among the meta-ethical data are, are data to the effect that like, yeah, agents, agents have reasons to do things. And sometimes they're quite powerful and you can't just shrug them off just because you change your mind um, or just bow out like, you know, we're, we're playing chess or something. Um, so I think these are deep features of the moral life. And I think these, these minimalist views that you're describing really don't go any distance to like accounting for these data. I see. Thank you so much. Sure.
All right. Uh, wonderful. So, Dr. Cuneo, uh, I wanted to come back. We have a couple of other questions, but I would like to come back a little bit to some criticism that has been directed um, to your argument that I'm going to go ahead and say I found very uh, persuasive, uh, pun intended. Uh, so, basically, you have argued that um, many versions of moral anti-realism entail some kind of anti-realism when it comes to epistemic steps. Um, so, a lot of people, for example, uh, some anti-realists uh, have responded by saying that they acknowledge both epistemic and moral hypothetical norms while denying moral and epistemic categorical norms. So what is a um, good response to that, and uh, what's your take on that? Thank you. So, so let me just make sure I get I get this right. So the thinking is, the, res the, the response to the argument is simply to deny that uh, there are categorical moral reasons and to deny that they're categorical epistemic reasons. Is that the response? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a response. That's, that's one way to go. Um, it does sort of, I mean, let's, let's put it this way. Um, the view I defend in uh, the normative web is a full blooded version of moral realism, which just commits itself to the existence of authoritative moral reasons. So, like one way of responding is just to, you know, re, you know, I suppose uh, uh, say there are no reasons of this sort. Um, and then I think the counter move is to provide some, some argumentation in favor of there being authoritative moral reasons. Um, I think there are some pretty good arguments uh, in favor of that conclusion. Um, the basic response that I've got a lot of sympathy with is, well, I have a, I have a bunch of things to say about this in the book, um, in which I note that epistemic reasons, a lot of them do not look hypothetical. It doesn't look like whether you have a reason to believe a proposition that's highly evident, get a lot of evidence in favor of it, um, and you're aware of that evidence, like that, that doesn't seem to hinge on whether you care about believing the truth or care about knowing stuff or anything. You, you, it sure looks like you have a reason and people would rightly call you, aptly call you irrational if you were to sort of <laughs> shrug it off and say, yay, I realize that's like really powerful reason in favor of this proposition, but you know, I don't care or whatever. Um, so I, I think if you take a close look at the epistemic realm, uh, I think there's quite good reasons to believe that they're not all hypothetical. And I think something is similar is true of morality. Um, and I think a promising line of argument here is to, to note that um, the categorical, the view that there are authoritative moral reasons makes really good sense of our practices of praising and blaming. Um, uh, we hold people accountable when they do terrible things and it's, it's um, not enough for someone to say, Oh, you know, I don't care about morality or I don't care about your well-being, or I don't care about the welfare of little kids. You know, um, that's not enough to sort of absolve them from being held accountable and being blameworthy. And the idea that there are authoritative moral reasons makes sense of this it explains why because people are blameworthy um, only if they had reason to act otherwise. The categorical view can explain that, the authoritative reasons view can explain that. The, uh, the view which denies that there are such reasons is a much more difficult time explaining that. Wonderful. So um, I think Bill wanted to follow up on that and ask, uh, what are some ways in which, uh, if you can briefly explain of course, um, that you, for example, believe um, it can be well, at least uh, shown somewhat that um, many of epistemic norms are categorical in nature and not hypothetical. Well, yeah, again, if, if um, so the basic idea behind hypothetical reasons is something like you have reason to engage in a certain kind of response 
only because, or at least in partly in virtue of, I, that's a better way to put it, partly in virtue of the fact that you have certain kinds of contingent commitments, desires, goals, and so on and so forth. And so the thinking is like you take a paradigm case of um, an agent having an epistemic reason. And so the one I just mentioned, the paradigm case would be one like you're presented with decisive evidence in favor of a proposition. And what the hypothetical view has to say is like, you have a reason to believe that proposition only if you have, only if you have the right sort of goals or desires where these are contingent commitments in your part. And that just seems wrong. That seems, no, of course not. You know, so long as there's evidence and the evidence is going to contribute to your states of understanding and knowledge and stuff, there's, looks like that favors uh, believing the proposition. Whether you have goals of, of certain kinds seems not relevant at all. I see. Wonderful. So, uh, Detroyer, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, in person, would like to ask you a question. Could you characterize what non-natural moral truths, moral properties, and moral facts are? Specifically, I'm wondering what it is in virtue of which one of those things is non-natural. Secondly, is the view you called minimal non-naturalism, according to which there are non-natural moral truths, but no non-natural moral properties or facts, even coherent? Naively, we might think that if there is some non-natural moral truth, then ipso facto, there is some non-natural moral fact. Uh, yeah, let me let me take that in reverse order. Yeah, I do think it's coherent. Um, and I think a lot of the coherence uh, can be appreciated once you sort of mark the difference between concepts and properties. So if you're thinking of truths, as propositions of various sorts and propositions as being constituted by concepts then and those concepts can be natural or non-natural um, then it seems like oh you could have a non-natural truth in virtue of the fact that the concepts are non-natural um, uh, even though the fact that say what the truth represents is is natural that seems that seems coherent um, at least I can't see any reason to think in the face of it that there's a problem. Ooh, specifying non-naturalism and um, the difference between naturalism and non-naturalism or just what, uh, what non-naturalism is, is super, super tricky. Um, I'll offer here are two, here are two characterizations. Um, um, one characterization starts with what I earlier called um, sort of the standard characterization of natural properties. So here's the standard characterization of natural properties. Natural properties are those properties that are suited to play an explanatory role in the natural sciences. I think like that's not that's not enough. I think I think what you want to say is something like. It belongs to their very essence, what they are, like what that property is, is to be a property such that it's suited to play a um, an explanatory role in the sciences. And like that's what its whole essence is. It's and so what you might ask, well, what are these explanatory roles that you're referring to? Well, stuff like causal roles, maybe maybe probabilistic entering to probabilistic relations of certain kinds. Um, those would be, those would be the sorts of explanatory roles that naturalists think like, yeah, that's, that's what the natural sciences are talking about. So a non-naturalist view would just be one that says, look, when you moral properties are properties such that what it is to be that property is not exhausted by um, it's being suited to play explanatory roles in the natural sciences. Um, that's, that's one way of marking the distinction. Another way of marking the distinction is like sort of close to that. But, um, but it basically says something like, 
um, the whole essence of a property is if you're non if you're non natural if you like sort of drill down into the essence of that property uh it's going to be normative all the way down as it were whereas a natural property is such that if when you begin to drill down in its essence of what it is um uh you'll you'll hit non normativity uh at at sort of its core that's sort of a picturesque way of describing a um the difference between the two properties but to put it just slightly differently non non natural properties are deeply normative they're at their core normative properties whereas natural properties are not at their core normative properties that's that's another way of doing it all right, wonderful. So somebody, I guess, wants to touch on our uh, earlier point. It's so often the case that in these discussions, um, everything really comes down to definitions. So uh, somebody wants to ask you, um, what would be your, um, let's say, operational definition of categorical norms? Like, how would you explain it to somebody um, in a simplified language? Thank you. Well, you, you, you might just start with the intuitive idea of, of a hypothetical reason. So a hypothetical reason is a reason you have, but you have it in virtue of contingent commitments um, that you have. So, for example, I might have a reason to go out and weed my garden right now, but that's just because like, I care about gardening. If I didn't care about gardening, I'd have no reason to go out and weed my garden. After all, it's like not that pleasant an activity. It's really tedious, um, right? So that's that's we, we're familiar with reasons like that. And then categorical reasons are just reasons that you have, but not in virtue of uh, the contingent commitments that you have or make. It's a little rough, at, to be honest with you. There's a important qualification I would make, but you might think, say, along with Derek Parfit, that um, if you're stuck in a burning building and there's a window in which you could jump to safety rather easily, you might, you might think, you have a categorical reason. You have a reason to get out of the burning building and jump out the window. And that doesn't depend on any contingent commitments you have. In fact, you know, if someone were not to jump out the window and were in instead, say, you know, be willing to burn to death in the building, even though they could easily escape, we'd be really puzzled. Like, oh, wow, that's something. Something's really strange is going on there. Um, but also, I think epistemic reasons, as I noted earlier, are pretty nice examples of um, paradigmatic categorical reasons. You've got a reason to believe proposition. Um, but it's not because of, at least in many cases, contingent commitments you've made. It's in virtue of the fact that it provides really good evidence and that evidence contributes to, say, understanding or knowledge or something like that. So that's the idea. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, okay. So I guess Quant King wanted to try again and ask another question. So go ahead. Quant King. Right, I guess he's having technical issues. Uh, okay, so yeah, Detroit had a question, but yeah, Dur wants to go first. Dur, go ahead. Hi, um, Hi, um just another just question. Another question. Uh, uh, when people, people, people oftentimes people will make arguments that, uh, that uh, well, well, if this if partners this in crime, crime argument goes through, then insert some sort of like crazy like. I'm sure you're familiar with like the spoof arguments that you, if you accept this argument, you have to accept that this, you have to be a realist about this domain and so on. Um, oftentimes people have like these disputes about aesthetic realism. So, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like most people want to say that there's some kind of symmetry breaker between aesthetic realism and like moral or epistemic realism. And I was just curious what your thoughts were on 
uh, that kind of dispute? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, in all honesty, I haven't thought very deeply about aesthetic realism. Um, I guess off the, off the cuff, I want to say that I do think there are aesthetic properties of various sorts, being beautiful, being sublime. I don't, I'm also inclined to be an objectivist about a lot of these properties in the sense that I think that things have them, but not in virtue of, say, you know, the way we treat them or our responses to them. So I, I, I'm inclined to think that there are objectively sublime or beautiful things. That's somewhat controversial. Um, um, but then it seems to me that if there are these properties, that something is beautiful, then there would be reasons to treat it in certain kinds of ways, not to aim to destroy it, for example, um, uh, on account of its beauty. So... Um, are those reasons categorical? Probably. I don't think it depends on me being committed to beauty or anything like that. I think I have reasons there. Are they authoritative? Are they like really, really powerful? Um, there, I'm not so sure. Uh, I'm inclined to think when aesthetic reasons come up against moral reasons, moral reasons went out. Um, you know, maybe there are cases in which you get strong epistemic reasons and I'm sorry, strong moral reasons and strong aesthetic reasons and the aesthetic reasons went out. So I guess what I'm sort of thinking myself too is a view according to which aesthetic realism looks pretty plausible to me, um, but I'm not sure that aesthetic reasons are on the whole authoritative in the way that moral reasons would be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Calisti wanted to ask her her or his question online. Go ahead, Calisti. Oh. Um. Okay. Uh. So there was a talk a while ago about what position you would. Um, go back to you if you were convinced that non-naturalism were false, and you answer that you would go back to naturalism. Yeah, as a default um, yeah, fallback. So yeah, my my question is kind of it's similar to that, but it's a bit it's a bit more specific. Um, first, what is the most what what would you retreat to if you were convinced just realism is false in general? Um, so I'd be yeah, I'd be some sort of constructivist. Yep. Okay. Um, and in a, so, what version of naturalism seems best to you? I guess seems most convincing. There would it be yeah. something like Cornell realism? Be something like uh, Aristotelian um, views or what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. I think probably Cornell reason, realism would be for me the leading contender when it comes to naturalistic views. But uh, I do want to acknowledge that Cornell realism really hasn't been hammered out and really hasn't been developed with the sort of care that it needs to be in order to see like exactly where its challenges lie and how it does well. Um, so Richard Boyd has you know, his famous paper and that's an amazing paper. Um, the 1988 paper, How to Be Moral Realist. Uh, but it's programmatic. You know, a lot of that stuff just needs to be, to be hammered out. So I say Cornell realism looks the best, but, but um, I also want to acknowledge that that might be because the view just hasn't been worked out with the sort of care and detail that it requires. All right, wonderful. So um, Detroyer had a question uh, again. Uh, faith is a term used in a myriad of ways, both by those supportive and those critical of religious practices. How do you prefer to use the term and how should we understand 
what a life of faith is. Oh, okay. This is a this is a big turn away from ethics. <laughs> um, yeah, I I really like the work that Dan Howard Snyder and uh, Dan McCoin. Dan Howard Snyder's at Western Washington. Dan McCoin's at Boston College. That they've done on faith. They have a whole series of essays, and they've been working on a book on faith, not just religious faith, but faith. Um, um, so as they see things, and I'm worried I'm not going to present their view accurately, but as they see things, faith has a cognitive component. Um, what I think they rightly point out is that this cognitive component can take different, can be realized in different ways. So faith might include belief, but it might include something much weaker, such as acting on the assumption uh, that something is the case, where you don't believe it, but you sort of act on the assumption that something's the case. And then faith also includes um, a volitional component, um, something to do with the will, and it's something in the neighborhood of trust, where there's a close connection between faith and being faithful in the sense that um, uh, to have faith is to be faithful to something in the sense of trusting, being committed to it, and being resilient. So I think that those sorts of consider those sorts of broadly volitional features cluster together, trusting and being resilient and committing oneself to something. Um, and they're probably cognitive elements have to do with emotion and feeling that in belong in there. So that's that's the general th thought. Uh, faith is a is an attitude or a stance that has a cognitive component that can be realized in different ways and a volitional component that involves such things as trust, resilience, commitment, a certain kind of grit. Um, and it probably involves some cognitive uh, elements as well. I see. Wonderful. So, um, there was a question about, okay, what can you tell us about your current project with John Benson and Russ Schaefer Landau? <laughs> okay, so it's big. <laughs> okay, so we set out to uh, write a book in Metaethics in which we develop a non-naturalist position. And when I say develop, I, uh, I, I do mean to sort of underscore that term um, our idea, it wasn't so much to go like defend non-naturalism from all the different objections that are out there in the literature. A lot of that's been done already. Our idea was let's try to develop the view. Let's try to identify the data that any meta-ethical theory needs to handle. Um, let's develop, uh, the claims to which a realist version of non-naturalism is committed, and then let's see to what extent a view like this can handle the data. So it's a like a really positive kind of constructive project, and as a result, I think it gives our project a very different feel from just about everything else that's out there in metaethics. Um, what's out there in metaethics now is great, but it tends to be much more polemical, where you're launching objections against rival views and then defending your view against objections. That There's some of that that happens in our book, but not that much. It's like I say, primarily objective. Let's develop, let's construct the theory. So we set out to do that. And what, what ended up happening is that um, we found we just had way too much material. So we now have three books. <laughs> there's a short book that's on philosophical methodology, nothing particular to metaethics, just philosophical methodology. And that book has been accepted by Oxford and will be coming out, I would say within the next year, just undergoing its final revisions. 
And then that's called, the, the title of the book is called Philosophical Methodology. Uh, the second book is called The Moral Universe. And that's the book that focuses on uh, the metaphysics of moral, realist, non-naturalism and develops it. So we have finished that book and sent it off to the press. So it's with Oxford at this point, it's under contract and we'll get referee reports back, you know, hopefully within a half a year or so, and then revise that book. And hopefully within a couple of years, it will see the light of day. And then there is the third book, which we've entitled Grasping Morality, which focuses on the epistemology of um, intuitionism and uh, action. Uh, again, of the sort that would be very friendly to a non-naturalist type of position. That position, that that book sort of exists on our hard drives, um, an advanced draft that's I don't know, we're probably missing two or three chapters at this point. So maybe three quarters of the book exists in our hard drives. But um, the thinking would be, well, we'll turn to that book in the relatively near future to, to hammer out some of the, the big ideas. All right, wonderful. Uh, so a couple of other questions. What do you make of a normative or error theory, according to which there are no norms at all, at least no irreducible norms? I have in mind the works of Jonas Olson and Bart Strumer. Is this a philosophically respectable position? Yeah, well, Jonas and Bart are really good philosophers. Um, uh, they're clever, they're resourceful. So in a lot of ways, it's very nice to see these positions developed. Um, um, there are a lot of things to say about these positions. My initial reaction to these positions is that they're under motivated. Like that's kind of like the, the where I begin. So if you look at Jonas's book, um, Jonas kind of runs a, like a version of the argument from queerness, according to which normativity would be queer. But it's, from my perspective, really underdeveloped. And it's really hard for me to see how that one argument could sort of bear the load that Jonas wants it to bear. After all, the error theory is a theory that like basically disregards almost all the meta-ethical data. Um, and so like that, that, that argument, the, like the argument from queerness that Jonas develops like my initial thought is like that argument better be awesome. Um, and I don't really think it's that good. Um, at least it hasn't been developed, I think in a way that I can really appreciate its strength yet. Um, I would say something similar about Bart's project. Bart tries to motivate his project by focusing on the nature of properties. And so, he basically thinks if you embrace a, like a super coarse grained view of properties, according to which like two property candidates are identical, uh, if and only if they're necessarily coextensive, um, he thinks he thinks that if that view is about properties is right, um, moral realism is in trouble. I think that view of properties is like not very plausible at all. Um, and, and again, I have a hard time seeing like that could really bear the weight of like an argument for the conclusion that there are no reasons whatsoever, uh, including reasons to believe your own view. Like again, that, that view of properties better be like super, super good. And while Bart has some interesting things to say in defense of it, like I found myself, nowhere near sort of moved by the sorts of considerations that were brought in its favor. I mean, there's just, it just seems to me there's some really, really obvious is not the, and that's not the word I'm looking for. There's some really deep problems with this kind of view. It, uh, it flattens out the metaphysical landscape in such a way that you like, it takes no account of how there could be, 
coextensive things with different essences, for example, which seems like a real life possibility. I see. Uh, we had another question here. Evolutionary debunking arguments like mm. that by Sharon Street have uh, have been used to undermine the warrant of our moral beliefs. How serious of a challenge do you believe these sort of arguments present? And do you think your current moral epistemology is suited to avoid these problems? Yeah, okay. Uh, another interesting question. I, you know, I, I have gone back and forth about these arguments. Like, at some moments when I'm teaching them, I think, wow, this is really interesting. And there better be some, some, you know, realists are going to have to make some moves that are going to be controversial in response. And then in other moments, I've thought, ah, these arguments don't really have much going for them. They're all these problematic uh, uh, assumptions. So I think um, at the end of the day, they're interesting to think about. They raise a host of interesting issues. I think they're going to force realists to come clean on certain commitments of theirs. But at the end of the day, I don't really find myself moved by them um, for a variety of reasons. Um, in our third book, we have we have things to say about the argument I've I've treated it in a couple places, including the end of speech and morality, and uh, in a in a um, in an essay um, in a volume edited by Daniel Starr, the Handbook Oxford Handbook of Moral Reasons. Um, that essay draws upon work by William Fitzpatrick at Rochester, which I think is really good, and also my co-author John Bengtson. So I like to think about these arguments. I think they raise all sorts of interesting issues. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I think there's some really, really powerful things to be said in response to them. I see. Uh, wonderful. So we have a couple of others, uh, and I think we'll wrap up after that. Okay, so uh, there was a question about your view on free will. What accounts do you prefer and why? Oh, about free will. <laughs> yeah, it's not something I think about a ton. Um, I did write a paper with my, with my um, colleague, Randall Harp, that came out in 2019 in Philosophical Quarterly on Thomas Reed's agent causal version. Of review of free will. Um, I've got some sympathy with that. Uh, but I'm not highly confident in all honesty. I think my instincts are incompatibilists. I remember just being baffled by compatibilism when I was presented with the view. Uh, I'm less baffled by compatibilism, so I'm somewhat more sympathetic with compatibilism these days. Uh, but I think my sympathies probably lie with incompatibilism. That's that's kind of where I am right now, I would say. I find Van Wagen's consequence argument pretty good argument. Yeah. I see. Uh, so another question. Suppose someone takes epistemic norms to be not categorical, but means to various ends, such as being able to make reliable predictions. Some of these norms may uh, have become constitutive of what we call rationality, but these norms have no special authority over and above our conventions or instrumental reasoning. Is this a plausible approach, and if so, does it seriously undermine companions and guilt argument? Uh, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, look, you could hold that epistemic reasons are categorical, and also hold something like 
the reasons are categorical, but they get a lot of their oomph from the way in which they help us to the world. So it might be like the practical importance of representing the world accurately um, is grounded in the fact that doing so helps us to live flourishing lives. That's, that's completely compatible with um, epistemic reasons being categorical. So I'm a little wary about um, the instrumentalization move that the question seems to, the, the question sort of raises. There, there are ways in which epistemic reasons might depend on various sorts of practical considerations which doesn't sacrifice their categoricity that's that's i guess what i want to say about that i don't know if that was too abstract no i think it was fine it was uh really good and uh i guess a couple of questions before we wrap up um let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Uh, yes, um, you have touched uh, in some of your work uh, and addressed arguments uh, that, uh, like divine hiddenness that have been made against Kant. Can you briefly touch on uh, what most uh, philosophically sophisticated arguments that uh, use divine hiddenness as an argument against God look like, and what are some of your objections? Oh, in the hiddenness um, literature. Oh goodness. <laughs> yeah, again, this is this. <laughs> um, this is an area in which I sort of dipped my toe and thought into, and then I thought about it for a while, and then I haven't really thought about it in, in <laughs> quite some time. Um, I guess the the overall impression I I came away with was. The various versions of the argument as developed by Schellenberg, um, I don't think they have legs. Uh, I don't really think they're very powerful arguments at all. I do think there's a, a powerful intuition or concern um, that animates them. And I take that concern, that intuition really, really seriously. There's something very puzzling about the idea that it were got to exist and you know, say be as the central theistic traditions describe God, that God would remain so hidden. So that sort of thing does worry me, but it's one thing to have this intuition. It's one thing to be worried about it. It's, some, it's one thing for it to seem anomalous in various ways, uh, but it's another thing to sort of get up and running a good argument to non-theism from that intuition or conviction or anomaly. And well, I think what I ultimately concluded after engaging with that literature was that I just didn't see a version that was all that powerful. I think I feel similarly about the problem of evil. I take it very seriously as sort of an ex existential problem. I think there's something anomalous or something weird about a world like ours with so much suffering and theism, but Developing that into a compelling argument is is difficult, I think. Um, I think there's been more success there, but even then, um, I also think there's some pretty good replies to the arguments that are that are available. I see. Wonderful. Well, with that, we have gone just over an hour now, so we would like to say thank you so much for appearing here. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed this time together, and I hope the feeling was mutual. Oh, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks for having me, and thanks for all the great questions. Um, all right. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully right. we'll, uh, uh, we'll yeah, be in ahead. contact. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, this has been uh, recorded, and uh, we will publish it uh, as soon as we can get to it. 
So with that, thank you all so much, and uh, see you guys later. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kinea. We won't take any more. Thank you.